And I can remember as a child, what helped me so much deal with the things that I was dealing with was I really felt a soul connection. I felt like there was this part of me that was guiding me and helping me to understand things beyond my human development would have allowed me to do. And I can remember when I got to be a teenager, I was so fed up with so many things that I wasn't going to listen to anybody, including my soul. I remember when I shut that down. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to Art of Awakening. My name is Ona Christie, a visionary artist and mystic oracle, and I have a very special guest here today. I am super excited to welcome Deborah Shillette Wilson to Art of Awakening. So welcome, De Deborah. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So Deborah is an expert in trauma, and she's also a very awakened person. So uh, Deborah, I feel like you represent uh, this kind of golden sort of personality of somebody who who gets what it is to be, uh, you know, in this awakening process, and who has gone through an awakening process, but yet you have the um, the 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 professional certifications of like a, a, a counselor or therapist. Um, and I'm going to read your bio in just a minute so that people can hear that. But um, I, I feel like you are really addressing some issues um, with trauma, right? That, that I feel are really, really important for those who are on the awakening path, because for most of us, we have dealt with a lot of trauma and I can't wait to talk to you about this, but I want to introduce you first. So Deborah Charette Wilson is the founder and CEO of Country Pathways, an education coaching and counseling company. She's a Texas licensed professional counselor, national certified counselor, certified clear your beliefs practitioner, certified heart math practitioner. It goes on and on. She's also a certified professional coach. She has so much training behind her and over 20 years of experience in stress, attachment, trauma, and relationships. She's also an author. Um, so you've written Sanctuary Found, a novel about a woman's healing journey, escaping domestic violence, and also a book called Your Brain and Heart Want to Talk to You. I love that title. Can you hold that book up? Yes, I, I, I you know, the, the heart is so important, getting into the heart. And I, I love that you've written a book about this and, and about the brain-heart connection. Um, and you've also co-authored a book, What the World Needs Now, Healing Trauma in Ourselves and Our Children, and How to Stop Passing on the Pain of Intergenerational Trauma to the Next Generations. Okay, so that has won awards from the Texas Authors Association. And I think that also is really important for those who are awakening because we do have that like ancestral trauma that we take yes. on that we're here to heal right and then finally uh, Deborah has served teachers parents and other professionals with presentations on issues related to parent and child relations stress self-care for women healing trauma and more at conferences in Texas Virginia and Oklahoma and I see that you're presently working uh, you're going to be offering a free live webinar in a couple weeks here uh, three keys to the soulful self and I love that and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and how people can uh, sign up for that but all right, so Deborah, I am so thrilled to have you here because you represent this wealth of knowledge and information and support on this, this whole process of dealing mm -hmm. with trauma, which um, I, I guess maybe we'll start with, I, I wanna ask you what led you to become a therapist in the first place and, and also to specialize in trauma? Well, it came out of, of course, my experience because I, had childhood trauma and I, and also adult uh, domestic violence uh, was an experience that I had as well. Yeah. And, and another thing that it took me a while to kind of connect to this, but sometimes it's been traumatic to be a woman. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In the workplace okay. because of the lack of um, what I experienced in the workplace was uh, a lack of just because I was a woman, I didn't need different. I didn't need things. I didn't need to uh, advance. I didn't need to get a raise. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't need, you know, I mean, those were blatantly told to me. Back really? In the, now it's been back in the 70s. Oh, but I'm not right. So sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so sure uh, how much that has changed. I know there has been some change. Uh, right. But, but anyway, so just not, you know, having that experience of feeling discounted right. and dis- disappreciated. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that especially now, because like, we're still working through that, right? The attitude yes. towards women, I feel like men also are feeling really underappreciated in a lot of ways right now. And mm-hmm. I feel like it's both and there's all this unprocessed wounding and trauma that's been going on. That's exactly like through the workplace, through the family relations, through the, the intergenerational stuff. It's huge. And you've experienced a lot of that. Um, was there anything particular that you wanted to bring up as like any kind of pivotal moment that made you kind of realize this is what I want to do? Well, not necessarily. It's what I always did. Yeah. I was the go-to person uh, as a child. Oh. Uh, my mother was my first client and my family was my first group. Wow. So I was the one who, you know, tried to keep things going and, yeah. you know, take pick up the slack where my parents didn't I was the oldest of six children and you know my siblings I felt like were my children because I was the one who sometimes got up in the middle of the night to change their diaper and feed them and and when I was in high school um, I stayed home from school because my mother didn't feel like taking care of her her baby Um, so you know that's kind of I just never it was just kind of what I did yeah And then I was my friends. I was the go-to person they want to talk to about their problems. And I, so it was just kind of, I think I would have been that way anyway. Yeah. Uh, And then as uh, an adult, um, I guess it was until I was about in my thirties or forties and I began to kind of put some things together for myself. Yeah. That I decided, you know, why don't I go and get the credentials to do what I've always done? And then that way, you know, I can make my living with what's natural for me. Exactly. And that's beautiful. And I think that's a theme that that so many awakening souls kind of come to at, at some point in their lives, almost everybody, right? It's like, oh, why don't I just, why aren't I doing what I'm here to do? Right? <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was like kind of a no brainer, but it took a while to get there. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think that kind of barrier is to get there? Because I know a lot of people are like, there's some kind of resistance or even just like a a not realization, not even realizing this is what I'm supposed to do. Well, I think that goes to, you know, what, when you grow up developmental trauma, I don't Mm -hmm. think people use that term much, but when we're in development as human beings. Uh Now I do believe we come in as a soul. Yeah. And, you know, as a baby, we have our voice. Mm -hmm. We know what we need and we, you know, if we were hungry, we cry. Right. If we're feeling good, we go goo gaga, you know, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we have our voice, so we kind of know that. But then when our needs are not met as we're developing, that affects, well, of course, that affects the brain and the nervous system's development. But it right. also writes on the foundation of who we believe we are. Mm, okay and not and who we believe we're not so we start losing contact to me with the soul of ourselves because our human needs override those survival needs become like a distraction right right and uh, and I can remember as a child what helped me so much deal with the things that I was dealing with was I really felt a soul connection I felt like there was this part of me that was guiding me and helping me to understand things beyond my human development would have allowed me to do. It was kind of a weird experience, but it was my experience nonetheless. And I can remember when I got to be a teenager, I was so fed up with so many things that I wasn't going to listen to anybody, including my soul. I remember when I shut that down. Oh, do you remember that? I really remember it. And um, and it's come back to me many times (laughs) because you know. But I mean, maybe it's what I needed to experience what I experienced. Yeah, because it has taught me so much about what it is to be a human being. 
right. when you're not connected to your soul, yeah. when you're not listening to your soul. Exactly. So do you want to share a little bit about your healing journey, your own? Well, it's, it's not been a straight line. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like I listen to my soul and then I don't. Yeah. And then I have these crisis issues and then I'm like, okay, maybe I need to pay attention again. So it's <laughs> been kind of a roller coaster. And, and I, I, I have done a lot of workshops, I guess, back in the seventies, eighties, nineties, a lot of human potential movement things, a lot of spiritual mm -hmm. retreats, yeah. uh, a lot of research and reading you know, on different religions, mm -hmm. uh, sociology, psychology, yeah. Uh, history, religion. Um, and uh, so all of all of those things have been a, a part of kind of what I've tried, I've been integrating all this time, Yeah, you know, along with my, my own experiences and, in and in, in not understanding why is this going the way it's going? What's, and of course, along that journey, I learned that my developmental deficits have been the main thing that's gotten in my way. Mm. And what do you mean by developmental deficits? Well, we all have the need lifelong as human beings for a sense of safety, security, a sense of belonging, and a sense that we make a difference. Yes. And, but fundamentally, when we're children, if we don't have our, our emotional needs met, then those things go into deficits. So if, they kind of go into deficit mode. We keep growing, mm -hmm. but we're just kind of carrying those deficits along with us unconsciously. It's kind of like we don't know what we don't know. Okay. And, and if, you, if you define deficit, what is that? Well, that means we didn't get something that we needed. Got it. Okay. You know, it's like when you have a need, it's kind yeah. of like if you've got an itch and you scratch it and it's right. then it, then it's not a need anymore. Right. Okay. Okay. But, so, if, but so. if it doesn't, if, if you don't meet that need, it just keeps coming back. Right. Okay. So it's almost like I get this image of carrying around like a bucket with a black hole in it or something. Right? You know, well, that, yeah, I kind of, I talk about it. Well, with my puppets, I'll just use my little puppet. Oh, so this, yes. this is the trauma monster. Yeah. And so this is the part, you know, of us that I explain that carries our unexpressed, unintegrated, unprocessed traumatic experiences because we can't if we we can't deal with them then the body is just designed to suppress them mm -hmm. so right. it gets suppressed here and you don't know you have it until the right trigger comes along and this thing right. volcanoes out so to speak yeah yeah, I mean, well, those, those situations like well, why did that come out my mouth right right yes exactly yeah. those intent that in and to me, my rule of thumb is if I'm feeling something intense, not like a passionate kind of intensity, but I mean, just boom, yeah. uh, more than what is necessary for the experience, then I've got something I need to look at. That is a gem right there. What you just said, right? If you are experiencing emotions that are beyond what is really called for if you can look with your rational mind that's an issue um that's yeah. huge huge yeah. yeah and so that's that's why I give the trauma that's why I call it the trauma monster it was really mm -hmm. interesting is that when I've had these in my office when I used to have an office and I worked with children yeah children that were traumatized were always would pick this one out interesting that they wanted wow. to they wanted to play with well well children are so wise <laughs> exactly they, they well it. how do you wow. yeah that's another i've learned a lot from children and i've learned a lot from remembering yeah and and really connecting with the hurt child inner child that i I've, I've carried with me right right to connecting to those that aspect of myself that didn't get to express process and integrate the experience at the time because yeah. it was too big and we will default to what I call the big people if we're you know as children if we're going to have you know between our authenticity and attachment we will pick attachment which is connecting to the big people in order to survive and we default our authenticity 
Interesting, because a child is designed to attach to the parent, right? So that the parent can lead them and and help them develop into their own whole. Yeah, that's the theory. I don't see it much in practice. Because we We have generations of wounded children, right? Yeah, Yeah. yeah. because of that intergenerational trauma that I see is reaching a crescendo. Yes in our culture today. And people don't realize that we're reenacting from this place more right. than ever before. Yeah. yeah. And to me, that's a call for awakening. Okay, so so beautiful. Yeah, and do you see uh, when you work with people, because like, you don't work specifically with star seeds or anything, you know, you're, you're more of a mainstream therapist, but like, do you see a lot of the spiritual awakening happening through this process of, of healing and, and trauma? More so since COVID. Interesting. Interesting. Because if you have, a, if your trauma monster is full mm-hmm. and you get more trauma, it, it's going to blow up. Then, right it, then it gets triggered. Yeah. You might be able to keep a lot of this contained mm-hmm. and go on and function and do well in life. In, in other, you know, in a lot of different areas of your life. Right. But when it's, when you get more, more trauma or too much chronic ongoing stress, mm-hmm. then this, the container is not just boundless. Right. It has, you know, a limit. And once you've reached your limit, then you fall apart. Yeah. And wow. people don't realize that they don't look at that as, oh, maybe I need to deal with something that I haven't dealt with. Right. But that's to me where I, I, I like to help people get to, to where they understand, mm-hmm. you know, how trauma lives in our body. Because right. the mind remembers, I mean, the body remembers what the mind forgets. Right, right. And, and that's why we get triggered through our sensory system, okay. not through our head. We get right. triggered through what's below our neck. Interesting. So, uh, I d- sensory issues is that a part of the whole the kind of trauma constellation of of things that? Well, I, yeah. From from yeah. what you know, from what I've experienced and and learned and taught, yes, okay. that um, w- if you think about you know when you have an experience, how do you have an experience? your senses you have it in your thoughts no you have it in your body yeah the thoughts come later Mm -hmm. as you analyze what you experienced right but when you're having an experience yeah it's just in your body right you know well like when you know doing a painting i paint yeah and i'm in that painting place you think I'm thinking, but it's really, I'm experiencing something inside of me that's bubbling up, right. wanting expression, and it doesn't have words. Right. Yes. So I do colors, mm-hmm. you know, or a drawing or whatever. Right. Right. So yeah. that's through the sensory system, you yeah. know, and, the and, you know, I don't know if you, your people know about Candace Perch. She's not a, on the plane anymore, but she wrote a book called The Molecules of Emotion, and she discovered peptides and how those peptides in our body care. Are there, you know, it's like what she said is our body is our unconscious mind. Right. Because when we react to things from a sensory trigger, it's not like a thought out thing. It just right. you find yourself there. Yes. You know, you're just there and going sometimes wondering what the heck. <laughs> come from you know so that's the I guess the the fascinating thing about how we're made is that we can carry so much within us and and be brilliant and effective and help other people and be successful in all kinds of ways and then that right trigger comes along and we're brought to our knees and we just don't get it right right but see we can get it and we need to get it well, because it's almost like this, like telling us we, we there's something here to get, right? There's something. Right, here. exactly. Imagine. There is. There's yeah. something we haven't become that we haven't awakened to. Right, right. You know, and as I've awakened to the things that I couldn't express, process, and integrate as a child or a young woman, mm-hmm. then the wisdom of those experiences becomes integrated into my awareness. Right, right. 
And have you, oh, what's your feeling? Have you reconnected then with that voice that you said you had as a child? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I have definitely reconnected. Like, okay, we're not going to go away again. <laughs> right. <laughs> what, I've, you know, what I've learned is um, it's kind of like the body is the ego. And it's in this three-dimensional world, okay. but the soul is in the fourth dimension. It's in the invisible dimension. Right, right. Yeah. And we're having this invisible conversation within ourselves and with each other that we don't realize. Right, all, all the time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but first we need to get it with ourselves so we can get clear with who we really are and who we're not. Because as children, we buy into everyone else's definition of who we are and what's possible for us and what we can and can't do and we believe it yeah. now we may later you know especially as children until we're about like eight to ten we're in what's called a hypnagogic stage which mm. state which means we just take everything in as the truth we can't discern right on our human level yeah. and then we start noticing things and putting things together. Well, all along we're putting things together because we're also meaning makers. Right, right. We give meaning to our experiences based on where our consciousness is at that time. Okay, yeah. So I don't want my two-year-old consciousness running my life anymore. Right. Or my five-year-old or my teenager. <laughs> That's or even right. a 25 year old. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can kind of look and see sometimes by a person's behavior. It's like, oh, that's sort of like they got arrested at two in some ways that, you know, and it's coming out. Or, and, but see, actually, they did. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The trauma arrests us. Right. Right. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of like that. I kind of think of it as being suspended in, you know, kind of a suspension. Yes. You know, like they do on the, in the, uh, some of the movies with the starships and stuff and mm -hmm. they have to go oh, into right. The, right. You know, so it's like yeah. this part of this little piece of us in that experience right. goes into this kind of frozen place. Yeah. And it stays there until the right trigger comes along, which could be years later. And you're going, what the heck? Why am I acting like five? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? yeah. Why do I want to have a hissy fit? <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious about the puppets, um, because it feels to me like those are something that's really powerful because it's it's not speaking in words, right? It feels right. like you can connect to so those. So let me, styles. yeah, let me introduce you to my puppets. So this is Amy Gadella. Mm -hmm. She was the one I started out with first, because when I learned about the, it's the amygdala, uh, I couldn't remember amygdala, but I could remember Amy Gadella. And that's ah. how I presented her. Yeah. to to people uh children and adults to explain about this she's the fear receptor she's the watchdog she's always on alert for a threat yeah now used to threats we would think of threats as like a saber-toothed tiger chasing us right and so actually if it wasn't for this part of us none of our ancestors would have survived so we all come from survivors of course, yes. But we, that's but good also, to remember, right? <laughs> right? Yes, that's good to remember. But this part of us can, when it gets triggered, uh, it can get stuck on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's we can forget that we have an off button, so everything becomes a threat. Yes, that's why people have anxiety and depression and react badly and that kind of stuff is because they're they're on their nervous system gets on high alert, and so everything looks like a saber tooth tiger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you can see that playing out, I think, pretty clearly in what's going on in Especially our country and around the world. Since COVID, because like you said, it really ramped up that whole anxiety level overall. Yes, it um, did. Everything's triggering to so many people. Yeah, because it's a well, but her her job is to help us, number one, deal with the threat, identify a threat, and then remember the threat. So that if anything is similar to that threat that we survived, she's going to give us, make us go on high alert. Right. Okay. But see, that's the thing is if it's traumatic, then it gets stored in here. And when, uh -huh. and when she gets triggered, this gets triggered. Got it. Okay. 
Okay. And so, so uh, technically the, this is Hannah Hippocampus. <laughs> <laughs> She's supposed to be able to calm Amy down. Uh huh. <laughs> what's really interesting is that Amy is online in a human being by 18 months. Mm, okay. But the hippocampus, which helps Amy calm down, you know, kind of right. go back into homeostasis, yeah. is not online in the brain until 36 months. Wow. There's a gap there. So, yeah. So what that means is a, a human child at 18 months old, up until they're three, can't even learn how to self-regulate. Interesting. They have to have a calm adult right. to soothe them. Interesting. <clears throat> you know, and so if um, so, if Amy kind of goes on alert, it's kind of like think about like you're you're watching a movie at night, and all of a sudden you hear a bang, mm -hmm. and you go on alert. That's Amy. It's like, what is that? Yeah. And then you go check it out, and it's the trash can dog knocked it over so then you know the hippocampus comes on and says okay so we can calm back down right yeah you know and um and so that's kind of how i mean this is real elementary i'm not a neuroscientist but this is the best that i i came up with to explain basics of how we work well and so then you're you're this is a core cortex thinking oh, part of your brain yeah. so you can bring your brain back online mm -hmm. The problem is, so these work together. So the hippocampus calms Amy down and then you can get back in the thinking part of your brain. Right. But if you're a child, your thinking part of your brain doesn't get fully developed between 25 and 30 years old. When I learned that, I forgave myself for those years. Right. <laughs> yeah. It makes some really good decisions. I didn't have my yeah. <laughs> that's that's so pertinent right now especially because there's a lot about you know choices made by very young people yes and um that that sheds a lot of light i think <laughs> on a lot of things and as right. certainly in, in my own experience looking back at my own life it's like wow yes yeah. yeah i mean i me too i mean i can look back and i can see that really i guess the the big aha for me was I could not have done anything different than I did mm. until I learned different. Huge self-forgiveness there, isn't there? Wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so then here comes the heart. Oh, I love it. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, this is Sally Hart. And I started out, you know, like I said, working with children and trying to help children understand their stress. Mm -hmm. And that they weren't bad when they got stressed, but to learn how to calm down. Right. So then I, you know, so it's like, okay, so I got the neuroscience part. Now what? What do you do? How do you calm down? Well, that's where the heart came in. Because the Heart Math Institute was started back in the 90s, has done a lot of research on heart, the heart and heart rate variability. And mm -hmm. what that is, is the space between heartbeats. And what they discovered was emotions mm -hmm. affect the heart rate variability. Right. Now, we've made emotions. I think we're emotionally illiterate in this country, as, as well as illiterate with child development and illiterate in understanding the impact of trauma mm -hmm. and, and how to turn transform that trauma into triumph for people. Right. So um, what the heart math discovered was that emotions there are no right or wrong emotions emotions are energy and motion to me right right you know and you feel that and they vibrate and they vibrate at different levels of hertz yeah and so we have renewing emotions which are things like peace and calm and love and compassion and our depleting emotions are emotions like stress and anger and frustration and those mm -hmm. kind of things and so what they do is they affect the heart differently and the heart has its own nervous system. Interesting. It has 40,000 neurites. Okay. And actually the heart starts beating before the brain develops. Wow. And that so the- It's telling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
And so what they discovered is the heart and brain talk to each other. Mm. But if you measure the electromagnetic force field between the brain and the heart, the heart's electromagnetic field, they've measured three feet from the body. Wow. But the brain's is just not too far out. Yeah. So they speak to each other, but the heart speaks more to the brain than the brain does to the heart. And then I don't have a puppet for the gut, but the gut also gets into it. Mm -hmm. Because what happens in our emotions and in the brain uh, triggers our gut. That's why so many people, have, stress causes so much gut problems. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting because I, I know a, just a little bit about like ancient Celtic spirituality. They have what's called the three cauldrons and it's basically, it's oh. like her gut. Yeah. Yeah. And we've left the gut out, you know, and, and it, so the, again, in my own journey to where I am today, yeah. it was the, you know, the trauma and then the neuroscience and then the heart and then the gut. So it's yeah. like it's that's we're one system right and what fec- affects one cis part of this part of us affects other systems and then the other interesting thing about the heart is that they've found techniques to help you re-regulate yourself right so you can actually learn to shift from depleting emotions to the renewing emotions. And you can literally learn to shift your heart rate variability to where it's more coherent. Because if you look on a sine wave, when your heart is coherent, the wave is smooth and even. Right. But when it's incoherent, then it's all choppy. Yeah. 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 So we have, in a way, we have ways of making the invisible visible. But what's another thing that is so fascinating is that If you put a baby in a mom's lap and the baby's heart is connected to uh, a machine and the mom's brain is connected to to a different machine, you can watch their waves. They're kind of, when the mom's not focused on the baby, not much is happening. Mm -hmm. But if the mom looks at the baby and starts feeling Mm -hmm. her love for the baby, Mm -hmm those waves sync up. Wow. So we know that we have an electromagnetic field around us. It's been called lots of things. Now, I mean, and I think it goes beyond the three, three feet, but it's kind of like we show up to each other before we're even close to each other. Right. We're feeling each other's feelings. And as a matter of fact, there's something called mirror neurons Uh where what we see we, we kind of feel the same way is what we're, we're looking at. Oh, it's when some certain people walk in the room, you feel that presence. And yes. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's, and you go, walk in, it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you walk in a room and you just kind of feel the energy in it and you're going, what in the world? And then you find out later, somebody was having an argument before you got there. Right. And it's, you know, it's like, so that energy, so energetically, that's what I call the invisible conversation that we have it within, with ourselves, you know, between our ego and our soul, we're also having it with each other. And I think that's important to get because to me, it gives us, as we awaken and become more what I call into our soulful self, Mm -hmm. then that gives us the ability to create that energetic field that's more, you know, like a island of safety for people. Yes. Where people feel safe within our energy. Right, right. And where we can be more compassionate and understanding, not like being walked over. Yeah. Because we need healthy boundaries, but to where we're not so judgmental. Right about right. each other because we judge each other very harshly but i say that's because we're judging ourselves harshly you quit doing that and you quit you begin to realize that other people have got their own story right yeah you know but, but you also need to be mindful about whether you hang out with him or not <laughs> that's true right because you know we're not we're all interconnected <laughs> but we're not always here to like take on somebody else's well sometimes you have to love people from afar exactly (laughs) Exactly. yes 
So tell me a little bit about your work and maybe how it's changed over the years. Well, since I worked so much with children and actually the book, this, this little book I was, ba was my inspiration for it was a little girl I was seeing and I couldn't get the grown-ups to get what I was trying to explain to them about her behavior. I see. And I worked a lot with teachers and parents in school settings. And over the years, children's behavior has just become more aggressive and hostile and un people don't understand it. Yeah. But they don't understand children have stress. Children have this neurophysiology. You know, and so they're more they're more easily reactive when they're not getting their needs met. And then if adults get mad at them, that doesn't calm them down. And so over time, adults are getting more reactive because of the pressures they're dealing with and the stressors of their lives. So you've got stressed out parents and teachers, stressed out kids, and that does not a calming interaction make. Right, right. And um so I, you know, presented lots of things to two adults, the big people, as I call them, and they were stuck in their old paradigms and just didn't seem open to what I was saying and perceived me as just saying children should be allowed to do whatever they want, which is not what I was saying. What I was calling for is for them to come to a new understanding about stress and how trauma plays out in children so they could be more mindful about that and not be judging the children as bad kids right. or, you know, having bad behavior and that needed to be punished, mm -hmm. right. right? you know, so the more kids are punished when they're stressed out, it, it doesn't calm them down. Right. So it's like we kind of keep creating the problem we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So the book, you know, my, your brain and heart uh, and heart want to talk to you. I wrote, it's, you know, like a children's book, but it's really meant for adults to read to children to maybe understand children a little better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what I realized out of all of that was that the adults have wounded children inside of them. Right. Yeah. And so I started shifting my practice to working more with, with adults mm -hmm. and in particular women to help women grow and develop themselves into feeling more empowered right, right. Yeah. you know and to and to feel more uh well to self take more self-care because women are notorious for putting well i'd say you don't even put yourself on your list <laughs> not even last right not even, not even last you're just not even on the list and i was one of those who did that yeah too you know to my detriment so that was an awakening is like when you, if you keep giving and giving until you give that, you, you've given yourself out, then what good are you for yourself or anybody else? So I've learned that self-care is imperative to continue to other care as well. We need both, not one or the other. And then during COVID, I had to shift my practice to, you know, online. And I was kind of taken aback by people who were wanting counseling and therapy that said, I know that I had traumas in my childhood, and I think they're affecting me now. And I had never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's like there, somehow there's there's awareness that sort of. Yes. Sort of yes. It surfaced and yeah. it's just it keeps surfacing and. And I would share what some of what I've shared with you today with them. And they'd say, nobody ever told me anything about this. It makes it, it helped them make sense of their own experience. And that to me is very empowering yes. to really get yourself in a different way than what you thought, which wasn't right. usually very positive. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd like to hear more about kind of like the spiritual aspect of this and, and you know, anything that you've noticed in terms of, uh, um, you know, re reconnecting with one's inner guidance, um, you know, just, or even just people becoming more aware of, oh, there's a world beyond what we're actually, you know, yeah. with our senses. Well, what I've begun to 
say to people that I hadn't been saying because, you know, there's rules you have to go by as a therapist. But as I got more into coaching, mm -hmm. I felt a little more free. And then even in my fit in my, you know, therapeutic practice to present uh, this notion that I have about the soulful self uh, yeah. and how that part of us gets covered up and we lose contact with it, mm -hmm. but it's not gone. It's just covered up. And like, we need to be like belief detectives and archeologists to uncover what got covered over us when we were children and we couldn't choose other than to survive. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to that authentic self. Right. That authentic self of who we are is the soulful self. And then our, our, in our human development, the ego part of us is kind of run by fear. Right, right. You know, but yeah. the soul is run from love, unconditional love. Whereas I, because when I was thinking about all of this within myself, it's like love, love, love. I. I don't feel like what I grew up with love, even though that was told to me, uh -huh. I'm, I'm doing this for your own good. Right. But why does it hurt so much? <laughs> you know? And so it's like, oh, there's fear-based love. Yeah. And then there's more soulful love. Right. Which is caring and compassionate and, and accountable. It's also about holding people accountable for their behavior. That is such an important point, isn't it? Yeah. Because when we when we start coming back into ourselves, it's like we're we're literally we're we're becoming more adult, right? And, and yes. Responsibility, yes. and and then we start taking the responsibility. It, it is part of the healing. Right. Um, it is, and that. and so um, so where I'm kind of at with that now is that in order to really be more soulful, mm -hmm. I needed to heal my developmental deficits, you know, within myself and individuate. And I'm finding not too many people do that because they're stuck in their dependency needs on other people to uh, give them I guess, permission to be themselves. They, you know, it's like we try to fit in. We try to belong. But the thing of it is, is we don't realize that too often we've had to take our authentic self and stuff it down. Right, right, yeah. And go with the, you know, the big people's definition or it could be our peers. Mm -hmm. yep. And now we've got social media that people are trying to, play out they're playing out yeah. these developmental deficits to me yeah how many likes did I get there you know it's like to me it's like you plant a seed and you just every day you go and dig it up to see if it's growing right yeah you know and so if you're looking out here well how many likes did I get what did that person say oh they didn't like me yeah. you know oh the, you know oh these two people are going against me you know yeah that's yes. again, kind of you're not super being emotional involved. reactions, right? Yes, yeah. you're not being able to be your true self. Right. And that that's that concept in spiritual circles of finding your eye, right? Finding your this core. It's absolutely core. Yes. Yeah. The who you are, so that you can individuate. That doesn't mean you don't listen to other people. Right. But it's yeah. you take it under advisement and you're the authority right. that decides. Yes. Not Beautiful. somebody else. Yeah. So I love this direction that you are taking your work. It is so, so, I feel like it's core, it's central, and it's so important to get mm -hmm. out there. So I know that you have a couple of just free gifts or like you have a free gift and then your webinar that's coming up that's also free. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay. Yeah. I, I have a free gift uh, for, for your people. Uh, that's a little meditation. And uh, so, you know, I hope that they will enjoy that. And then also my free webinar is three keys to living from your soulful self. Nice. Okay. And that is on uh, September, was it 28th, you said? It's 28th. Uh-huh. September 28th. Okay. Yeah, so and I'll be sending more information to you about that. 
Okay, great. So if you're on my email list, you can expect a, in, an email about that. <clears throat> I will also put the um, the links to both your free meditation and a sign up to your webinar in the description box below this video. Oh, so, I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, great. All right. Well, is there anything else that you would like to share before we close the session here? Well, one thing I'd like to share is it's we have dependency needs. So we start out dependent yeah. and then we get independent. You know, that's me do it myself. It starts around two. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then the next level is interdependence. Right. Where we realize that we, you know, it's kind of like, I can do this for myself, but I need other people to do things for me. It's like, right. I depend on the electric company for my electricity. So we get stuck, I think, in being independent and I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I don't care who gets in my way. Yeah, yeah. And and that is still deficit needs, not met. Right, right. yeah. It's, it's still not like, to me, maturing into a soulful adult. Right. This is, is an interdependent being. Such, a, 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 just a... a, a a core concept that I feel like, because I've been learning and researching into like human, like the spiritual development of humanity, and it follows that same mm -hmm. pattern, right? We started out as more of a, a oneness kind of, but kind of more in oneness, right? But then we had to come down as the planet became denser, right? We came down into this 3D density, and right. the challenge was to discover our I, right? To develop our individuality. And now we're at this cusp of moving into that inter interdependence, but there's so much resistance because of all this, you know, the trauma that happened as we... Right. Um, so it's all as above, so below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it starts with us as individuals, doesn't it? And um, yeah, so yeah. beautiful work that you're doing it's so important in this world thank you so much for doing the work for being authentic and also for joining us here on art of awakening um it's just so much thanks for you for what you're doing it's well thank you for having me i really enjoyed it yeah me too so um and hi to all your people yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once more, um, Deborah's uh, free meditation and uh, the link to sign up to her webinar are in the description box below. Um, take advantage of that if it feels resonant to you. I really highly uh, recommend it, um, you know, taking advantage of that. And always remember you were born to be free. <laughs>